the main big idea we're going to talk about today is how a kernel makes a process. And that's mostly about virtual memory. I will also remind you exam one is going to be next week. Almost all the questions, except for maybe one or two, will be taken directly from questions you've seen on the notes. It is open um, resources. You can use the course website. You can use any resources other than other people to do the exam. The one restriction is after class Tuesday, you can't add any discussion on the course site that's relevant to the, the exam questions. But if you want to discuss any of the questions posted on the class notes before then, you're certainly welcome and encouraged to do that. So before getting in class, I want to talk about the big operating systems news today. So Microsoft has a new CEO. Microsoft started as a programming languages company, but pretty quickly became an operating systems company and grew into one of the, the largest companies. And this is the first really non-founder CEO they have. And the interesting thing, this is from the official announcement they made, that the reason uh, he joined Microsoft and why they hired him was because they needed someone who understood Unix. That is uh, an interesting development in history of operating systems. And uh, I don't know much about um, Satya, but it sounds like an interesting, interesting choice. And Microsoft is not dead yet. So there will be interesting things coming from this. I also have some stickers to award for problem set one. So the, the sad news is there were only two students who actually followed all the directions correctly. So that's a small enough number that you get a sticker just for following the directions correctly. And there are two students. One of them is actually an external student, so I only have one sticker to award. So Benjamin Foster is an external student. I guess if he notices on the video or the slides, I can mail him a sticker. I hope I can pronounce him in Is that close is here? Did I get the name mostly right? So you get your sticker for following all the directions for Prompt Set 1 correctly. The one thing most people didn't follow was setting up a release and tagging it for your repository. And we want you to do that so you have a record of what was actually submitted. And if you you'll continue to develop the code or change the code or do something after that, that's fine. But it's a good idea to tag things in GitHub when you hit a release point. The repositories you submit for problem set two and other assignments should be tagged versions. Today we're going to do a little experiment. So one of the answers on problem set zero about how we should make things better regarding implicit assumptions was that we should stop listening to young white males like me. Other people deserve a voice. And I don't completely agree with that because I, I guess I probably don't qualify as a young white male anymore, but I once did. And I want people to listen to me. But we're going to try for today. One, one thing I noticed because I'm recording classes, I think all the answers and questions and contributions so far were by people that probably fall into the assumed implicit advantages category. So I want to try for today that I'm not going to listen to the people that seem to fall into that category. And I, I will try not to make assumptions about whether you are or not, so you can judge that for yourself. And I'm going to encourage people who don't to contribute, and we'll try to ignore people that seem like they do. The other part of that is to actually encourage people to move around. So people tend to always sit in the same space. And I think we're close to a quarter of the way through the semester, and probably you've found a place to sit that's comfortable and are sitting in the same place. Some of you may move around. So I'm going to ask the people who, so I don't want to make the people who sit in the front move back, because there's sometimes good reasons people want to sit in the front. If you sit in the back, usually the, the only Good reasons for that are either you're too lazy because the entrances are near the front, in which case probably walking down the stairs and back is good exercise for you, or because you want to be like reading Justin Bieber's tweets or something like that during class and you don't want your classmates to see that and be embarrassed by it. So if you are in the back two rows, there's plenty of space near the front to come towards the front today. If the second reason is the reason you want to stay in the back, you still need your exercise, so you have to walk down to the front, and then you can go to the back. But people will see you do that. Um, if there's some physical reason you don't want to walk down the stairs or something, you can stay in the back. But otherwise, I would ask you to, to move to the front and see if the perspective is better. So I'm serious. You can do that now. OK, so I want to talk a few things about problem set two. First thing I want to remind people of is is the honor policy. And one of the things that you signed on to is, is not abusing resources, including things that were posted or other student solutions from the course last semester. And we had an assignment quite similar to what you're doing from Promise at 2 last semester. It's not hard 
to find our solution to that or other students' solution to that. And one of the things I will encourage students to do at the end of the semester, so you have a limited number of private GitHub repos that you sign up for with your education account, um, and you can make those public at the end of the semester and not, uh, not need to lose your private ones or lose your, your code. Yeah. So if you run out of, so you're going to need a private repo for problem set two and for problem set three and for problem set four. So if you're running out there, uh, Bitbucket will give you an unlimited number of private repos, I believe. Whether our auto grader will work with Bitbucket, we haven't tested yet. The other thing you can do, I, I don't think GitHub's that expensive. So if you're getting a lot of value out of GitHub and you want more private repos, uh, I think if you pay them, they're willing to give you more. But if you're just using from the, them for this class, you should have enough for free. You probably could do something like that. Whether that would violate the GitHub terms of service and intent, I would not speculate. Um, so uh, yeah, you can find creative ways to get more private GitHub repos. The, the thought of actually paying for a service on the internet I know is quite frightening and anathema to um, things that we do. But GitHub is probably one that is sort of worth paying for. But definitely not something you're required to, to have a paid GitHub account for this class. Two real tricky things for problem set two, and I'll, I'll talk about them. So the first one is background processes. So this is how you basically run a foreground process. You've got your main gash thread. It's getting some command typed in, and then you're calling some functions that run a command. That's going to create a process that's going to run. And you've just called some library function that's doing all that, and it doesn't return until the process finishes. So this is like a normal function call. You're waiting till it finishes. When it comes back, you get back to your main gash code and print the command prompt again and get another command. So how are things going to be different to make it a background process? How much of this do we need to change? I should mention with, with my rule about not listening to young white males or equivalent today, that doesn't mean that, I will, that I'll go on when I ask questions without getting an answer. So if I don't get any answers or questions or anything, then we'll have a long, boring class. Yeah. OK, good. Yeah. So we want it to be really similar to this except for we want is this run command not to happen in the main thread. We want it to happen in a different thread. What we really want is to do something where we're going to create a new task. And that new task is going to do almost all the th same things exactly the same way we did to create a foreground process, but they're doing it in a new thread. This is all the same process still. Right? This is all still our gash process. The new task is part of that same process, but it's a new thread. So now, after we've spawned it, well, this thread keeps going. So we've spawned a new thread. In that new thread, which is a task in Rust, now we're going to run the command. And that thread's going to finish. Maybe we have to do something here, maybe not. But the main thread, which is the one that's going to print the next command prompt and keep going, well, that keeps running and doesn't have to wait for this to finish. That's the main thing that you need to do for background processes. Yes? <coughs> OK, good. So good question. So what do you need to do when this finishes? You don't necessarily need to do anything, because the main thread doesn't really need to know when the background process finished, unless it can do something with the background process. The things you might wonder about whether you need to do, so there might be things you want to clean up. So you've set up files and streams, and if they don't get flushed, then you might never see the output, or you might never get the output written to a file. So you probably need to do, depending on whether those things were in here. So the way I drew this, this whole red box was everything you do to run and finish a foreground task. Uh, sorry, run and finish a foreground process. All those same things that you needed to do to clean up a foreground process, you still need to do to clean up a background process. So if I understand the question, so the question is, so if the background process writes to standard output, should you be able to see it before it finishes? Is that what you're asking? You're not expected to do anything like that? Some shells provide, so within Bash, you can do things like type jobs and see all the things that you started in that shell. So that's a, a nice feature to have. That's not something that you're expected to do for problem set two. You can kill the background process using regular commands that you would run in your Gash. So if you, you get your Gash command back, right, and you know what PID this is, you could, in, in Gash, you know, run you know, kill and then put in that PID and kill the process that's running. So you could do that as a regular command that you run at the command line. But you don't need to build anything extra in, into your shell. So the other 
thing I wanted to talk about was the more complex commands that you're using putting redirects and pipes together. The assignment was not real precise on what exactly you had to handle. A shell like Bast supports quite a complex language of redirects and pipes. If you can support everything in this grammar, you've done what we want for, for the gash cell. So that's more than just putting one pipe together. You should definitely be able to have any number of pipes chained together. And that's a very useful thing to be able to do and shouldn't be too difficult to support. I'll show you the example test that Whalen came up with as the most evil test, which you're not required to pass this one. If you do pass this, you'll get a sticker, unless so many of you pass it that I've run out of stickers and then we'll have to figure out something else. So what does that, so this is all one command that's split over lines to fit on the slide. What do you think this does? This is the kind of style of things that Unix was really designed and advocating, that you would put all these little programs together to do something complicated without having to write a new program. So we could figure out what it does by looking at each step separately. So curl is just getting a web page. Then the next thing is, so sed is doing replacements, and it is basically replacing everything that's not an alphabet letter with a space. So if we look at the output now, all the things like brackets and exclamation points will go away, and they do. So now we've removed all the non-alphabets. TR is another replacement, so this is replacing all the uppercase letters with the corresponding lowercase letter and replacing the space with the new line. And then we're piping all that through grep. So what does the, so once we've replaced all the uppercase with lowercase, what does the grep here do? Okay, so here's what we've got before the grep. Everything's been turned into lowercase letters and separate lines, yeah. Yeah, so the grep is getting rid of the empty lines. There are probably maybe, maybe easier ways to write that grep, but it's keeping just the lines that match the alphabet A to Z, and then we're sorting them, and the dash U means just keep the unique lines. So if the same word appears more than once, we're just keeping it once. So this is going to give us the vocabulary that's used on that web page, and we could do this with any web page and get a list of all the words that that page uses. Maybe not the most useful thing, but it works, and we can see that I misspelled Zepto about four different ways, so I guess it was useful. The other tricky thing that you have to do for problem set two is handle signals. And in the version of Rust that students used last semester, this was not actually possible. But they added things to version 0 0.9 that does make this possible. What do you need to do to handle a signal? So let's assume now we've started a process in the foreground. So we had our main command that ran here. This is our gash process. And we've started some new foreground process. So we've got our child process, and the user types control C. So what happens when you type control C? Yeah. It kills the program. OK, so that's the end result to the user. Let's go through all the steps. So what's the first thing that happens when, it, when someone presses a key on the keyboard? What happens? Does anyone get the keystroke before the shell? What does it cause? So, so you, you hit a key. What are all the things that happen when you press a key? OK, so eventually your program might see it on standard input. There's a long distance between sort of you hitting a bunch of plastic on your keyboard and a letter coming in on standard input. So who actually sees the control C or any key press before your program does? The person press, OK, so, so yeah, so if, if uh, the user who actually presses the key knows they press the key, in terms of the things that are running on the computer, what's the first thing that happens when a key gets pressed? Before it gets to any user program. Right? How do you know which program is supposed to get it? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, right. So the key press is going to cause an interrupt. That interrupt is going to go to the kernel. Right? The kernel is going to see the key press. And there's no way the key press could go directly to your user program because you've got lots and lots of processes running on the machine. You've got a physical you know, key press on the hardware. There's no way to know which program should get that key press. Right. So the program that sees the key press is the kernel. Right. So that control C is going to go to the kernel. There's an interrupt that goes to the kernel. And what the kernel does when it 
sees a control C, well, it interprets that. That means generate a signal to the program that that was intended for. Where would that interrupt go? Sorry, where would the signal go normally? So if you type in a, a control C in your gas shell, even though there's a program running in the foreground, who's going to see the interrupt? Yeah, the shell is going to see the interrupt. The, the, the operating system doesn't know that the intent of the user was to kill this child process. Right? All the operating system sees is someone pressed control C, and the user was focused on this shell that was running GASH, and so it's going to send to the GASH process a signal. And it's the interrupt signal that's generated by control C. If your GASH program doesn't have any handlers for that, that's going to kill the program. What you want to have happen in a shell is instead of killing the program, you want to kill the foreground process. That's what should happen. That's what happens in Bash and what you want as a user when you do control C in a shell. How are you going to change things to make that work? So what do we need to do to prevent gash from stopping when it gets the SIG interrupt signal? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. So that's exactly what we want to do. Right? So to prevent gash from crashing, we need to have a SIG handler. So we're at handler. Right? So we're going to send things up. So we've associated some code, which is a signal handler that responds to this interrupt. And what we want to do in that handler is we want to send the SIGINT signal to interrupt the foreground process instead of killing GASH. So that's what you need to do for that question. It's going to look something like this. Your signal handler is running inside the GASH process, and it's going to generate a signal that will interrupt the foreground process that you start in your shell. And unless that process has a signal handler, it's going to kill that process. This is an inherently unsafe thing to do. Right? Anytime you've got a signal handler, you're saying whatever code happened to be running, once that signal comes in, we're going to jump to some other code and run that. And in terms of sort of having predictable behavior and truthiness and all the things we want our robust, reliable programs, that is a really unsafe thing to do. Right? You're jumping around in some unpredictable way. So to do that, you end up needing to use the C library. And you're going to need to have unsafe. So you're going to have at least a small amount of code in your GAP shell that is unsafe to handle signals. You may need a little more unsafe code, but you should really try to have as little unsafe code as possible. 